Oh, I can unmute myself. Wow. Hello, hello. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, thank you, uh, everybody, for your introductions and for hosting us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I don't have uh, anything prepared uh, on purpose because I said, you know what, we're going to do it just like I did in high school, and I'm just going to make this up as I go along because that's how I how I thrive or something. Um, so if I miss uh, anything, uh, I'm going to try and make the uh, the presentation pretty concise, and then I'll open the floor. Uh, to questions uh, as soon as possible, because um, I don't know what you guys are interested in, who knows, I don't know. So um, yeah, my name is Willows. I uh, started uh, Shrugging Doctor Beverage Company um, in, uh, well, we opened in 2017, uh, early 2017, and um, so that we just had our four-year anniversary actually two days ago, so um, that is exciting. I haven't slept in like four years, but uh, I've also been drunk for four years, so you can't complain, right? Um, we, uh, my partner and I started the business. Um, it was uh, 2014 uh, was when I graduated high school. I was uh, 17, 18 years old, whatever. Uh, right when I turned 18, I got booted out of my hot parents' house. Um, and I moved into a house that I rented um, with a bunch of other 18 year olds. So I'm sure you can imagine we had uh, some, a lot of people in and out of the house uh, every every day i was gonna say weekend but um more honestly it was uh pretty much every day you know you'd uh you pass out drunk and then wake up in the morning and kick people awake that were on the floor and then turn on the xbox and start drinking again right but um so we took the opportunity to start making our own um wine and cider and stuff um because i we were 18 and broke but it got to a point where you know we were sharing it with everybody in the house uh, that were coming over and they would uh, they stopped bringing their own alcohol that they bought. They're like, oh, I'll just drink yours, it's way better. So I was like one light bulb. I'm like, hmm, okay, maybe we know kind of know what we're doing. Now this is also, uh, you know, the first time in my life, oh, look, I have rent to pay and bills and stuff. So it was like, I can either get a job or start a business. So it's kind of like, okay, what business are we starting then? Um, and we sat down and we said, okay, what are what are we good at? What can we do? So uh, we discovered that uh, the you know the wine that we were making was was popular with people. So we said, okay, maybe that's something we can do. And as we looked into it, uh, you know, just kind of happenstance, 2014-15 uh, was when uh, a lot of deregulation in the uh, in the liquor industry in Manitoba was happening. Um, so. If you people um, remember, uh, I don't really because I was a child, but in the you know 2000s and 2010s, uh, there was something called MLCC, which is Manitoba Liquor uh, Control Commission, and they uh, regulated uh, themselves and then sold all the alcohol. Um, so I, from history telling us that government regulating itself is a great idea. They, uh, in 2014, decided to split into two entities, uh, MDLL, Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries, and then LGCA Liquor Gaming, and or it was LGA Liquor Gaming Authority, uh, now uh, Liquor Gaming Cannabis Authority uh, um, since the uh, legalization of marijuana. Uh, and uh, yeah, so now we had a body to regulate and a body to, uh, to distribute. Um, something like 15 licenses became free and uh, it became much easier to uh, to to um, to make alcohol and sell alcohol in in Manitoba. Um, and if you guys are familiar with uh, with the liquor industry in Manitoba at all, that was when all the craft breweries started opening. So previous to that, we had one or two uh, craft breweries, uh, and now we're up to I think 18, if if memory serves, in the, over the last three or four years, right? So. Um, We've, uh, yeah, deregulation makes business better. Who would have thought? I won't dive too big into that because I know we have a CFIA inspector in, in, the, in the video here somewhere. So I don't want to offend anybody. Um, it, well, I don't know. What are, what are we doing? So now it's, um, it's, it's four years later. Zerp, fast forward into the future. Um, we're making wine. Um, like BJ said in my intro there, we, I think we have about 20 products. 
Uh, we have eight core products that are available all year. Um, and then we have a range of uh, small batch seasonal stuff that we make out of Manitoba fruit. So we have like a Saskatoon berry, a uh, strawberry rhubarb, um, blueberry, uh, sour cherry, um, raspberry, different things like that, that kind of are available for two months and then, and then sell out and, um, and, and then come back. Um, we've been uh, growing uh, pretty substantially every year, I would say. We've been about doubling in size every year of operation. Um, since we since we opened uh we're gonna do about two thousand cases this year i believe which makes us a very very small winery but um uh, when we started um I'm, i guess i'm jumping around the timeline a bunch but you know it'll be like a christopher nolan movie um we uh we started um so when you're 18 years old and you walk into a bank and you say, hey, I have never had a job before. I've never run a business. I have no credit history. Uh, I have no assets, um, but can I start a business please? Can I have some loans? Give me the loans. And they say, what business are you trying to start? And I say, wine manufacturer. And they hear, I just wanna get paid to get drunk. Um, so we got, uh, told to go away by a few banks, um, but we, we made, we pretty much approached every bank and credit union uh, in the province to, to fund our little crazy venture. Um, none of that worked out, um, but you know, it is what it is. Uh, we ended up working with an organization called the Futurepreneur. Uh, they're a great resource. Um, they basically take all the young, uh, you know, business owners. Um, it's like, they specialize in like under 29 years old um and give you give you a little bit of money and uh they helped us with our business plan uh and then they brokered a deal between us and uh the business development bank of canada which uh gave us uh a loan for approximately fifty thousand dollars and um so i always tell that story because zach and i put in zach is my partner zach and i put in uh, fifty dollars of our own money we split it halfway 25 25 to buy uh, home brewing equipment. And then uh, that was the, uh, that was all the money that we put in uh, into the operation. We just, um, you know, kind of sold more bottles to, to make more money to buy more stuff, right? Uh, obviously the 50,000 uh, was our starting cash. Um, and I remember I told this story to a, uh, a, a, an owner of a brewery here one time, we were just, you know, at his bar shooting the shit. And um, I told this story and I said, you know, Fifty thousand dollars, and it was kind of loud in the bar. And he goes, five hundred thousand dollars? That's pretty good. That's that's less than we spent. And I go, no, 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 fifty thousand dollars. And he goes, hmm. Um, it's a you know, if you know anything about business, uh, specifically manufacturing businesses, which are very asset heavy, um, fifty thousand dollars is not a lot of money. Uh, evidently, it did not take us very far. Um, we ran out of that money before before we opened um, or very close to being open. The uh, permits and planning uh, of the city of Winnipeg told us five days, five business days for an occupancy permit, which ended up taking 10 months. Um, and then I later found out that that was because their inspectors were going to Hooters and, and, and shoveling their own driveways and stuff during business hours. Um, if you remember that, that was a global news or something did a whole expose on that. So uh, that's great. Thanks, taxes. But um, yeah, so we ended up wasting our entire startup money on on uh, on rent pretty much in the building that we had for 10 months that we couldn't use. Um, and then the other part portion of the startup money we spent on uh, on on some tanks, on some some tins, some ingredients. Um, and uh and yeah so we we opened uh late january 2017 i think it was the 20th or 21st i think 20th of um of january we opened and we had rent due on the 31st and we had uh no money i think we had negative money in the bank account so we said okay you know rents 2200 bucks that's how much we got to sell between now and the end of the month um to not go out of business and if we don't do that then we just go out of business and uh we so we did 
Um, so that was awesome. And uh, it continued like that, basically not having enough money for bills and saying, okay, well, we got to sell wine or else we'll go to business. Uh, continued like that until um, still. Um, just kidding. We're doing a little bit better now. But uh, first two or three years, probably, we just did not have any money left at the uh, at the end of the month. So uh, it is what it is. But uh, yeah, we, we started off making uh, so the original plan, little known fun fact, um, this company now, which is called Shrugging Doctor Beverage Company, was actually founded as Shrugging Doctor Brewing Company, LTD, in uh, 2016 or whenever I, I, we formed a corporation. And that was because the original intention was to make beer. Uh, beer was one of the things that we were making um, in the basement. We were making uh, um, basically a rudimentary version of our of our mead, which is made from Manitoba honey, a rudimentary version of our apple cider, and then we were making uh, uh, cool, like fruit coolers, and then we were making beer, and that's why. So, in my mind, when I was translating my, uh, you know, what we were currently doing as home brewers to. Um, what I wanted to do as a business, that was, okay, we'll take what we're making right now that people like, and we'll make it into a business. But uh, it uh, very quickly occurred to us, uh, number one, that uh, brewing equipment is much more expensive than winemaking equipment, evidently. And, uh, but more importantly, um, when I wrote the business plan, uh, the only locally owned, locally operating uh, brewery in the province was Half Pints Brewing Company, shout out to them um that was it and by the time we had gone through the whole rigmarole of getting of getting because remember this was 2014-15 and we opened in 2017 right so that was that two years or whatever it was that was the time of us getting funding and and learning and writing the business plan and and then the 10 months of getting the building and wasting money etc cetera, etc cetera. so in that time uh like three other breweries had opened i think that was torque brewing company barnhammer brewing company uh, Peg Beer Co., uh, Rist in Peace, and uh, Capital K Distillery also had opened. So in that time, um, obviously it was nothing compared to now, but I'm kind of like, okay, maybe beer's getting a little bit saturated. Um, and then that combined with the, uh, with the price of the equipment, we just kind of dumped the whole beer plan. Um, so we got it in, we got into, uh, into wines um, because that was kind of like what was, uh, what was left, what we were good at. So um, the the fruit wines, we didn't really have a lock. Number one, it was January in, in Winnipeg. So there wasn't much fresh fruit out there that we could go pilfer. Um, and it was also, we didn't have a lot of money to float to, uh, you know, to buy a lot of fruit. We didn't have a press. We didn't have, uh, you know, anything like that. So um, we started off with a, a version of our mead, which is made from honey, like I said earlier. And we started off with a with an apple cider. We're like two of the first products that we released to the public. And I remember when we first sent in um, our application, because now we're, we're stopped in Liquor Marts, in Manitoba Liquor Marts. I have nine products with them. Uh, we're in, I think, 87 stores in Manitoba. Um, but if I think everyone here is from Manitoba, you're obviously familiar, the only people that can legally sell alcohol in the province is is the liquor marks, is Manitoba liquor and lotteries. So we had to try and get in there. And that was that was quite difficult. Uh, we basically sent in one of our meads uh, to get listed. And remember, this was we didn't have any equipment. We didn't have uh, barely any knowledge, right? We were 18. Um, and uh, we I don't want to say it was a bad product we sent them, but it probably, you know, probably was the quality. You know, the quality may be questionable. Who knows? And uh, and uh, they basically responded. I actually have this email framed on my office uh, on my office uh, wall. They said basically, um, we're going to stock you as a favor to you. Um, we don't think it's going to sell. We don't like it, but you're a local company. We want to support you. Um, will buy 28 cases, which was the minimum they could possibly buy because uh, they have like 28 general list stores. So, and then so one case a store, right? So that was literally the lowest they possibly could have bought from us. They said, we'll do that, stop bugging us. And uh, I was, 
pleasantly surprised, I guess, when um, when three weeks later we got another email and said, hey, can we get another order because we sold out? Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I guess I, we we got a lot of um, a lot of uh, news buzz. I think when we opened, um, I'm a pretty big fan of uh, kind of guerrilla marketing and stuff. I remember on our launch week, we dressed up like doctors and ran through like Portage Place Mall or um, Polo Park Mall, like throwing business cards at people. Uh, I remember we got kicked out of the forks for the same thing. Um, and we just kind of, uh, you know, try to be outlandish with our marketing. I mean, shrugging doctor, right? It's, uh, it's kind of funny. People were like, what was that? And then, um, yeah, here we are. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I just, that's kind of how we started. Uh, then we just sell, I guess, sell more um, than we did last month. And that's, that's the, that's the plan. And then uh, 2018, we get a call. Um, I won't go too deep into the story, but basically we get a call that says, Hey, would you guys be interested in um, making a grape wine? For Manitoba grapes, and we go, yeah, obviously. Like, I didn't know you could grow grapes in Manitoba. <laughs> he goes, yeah, actually, I have a, a vineyard that I that I work as a hobby um, in southern Manitoba. And um, let's let's figure something out. So that would have been 2018, I think. We uh, we met uh, this guy, and uh, he has a vineyard. Um, in Southern Manitoba that he grew as a, he describes it as a hobby gone wrong um, because now we came along and we're like, okay, we need more grapes um, because grapes take about five years, three to five years to, uh, to actually start producing fruit once you plant the vine. So obviously it was unrealistic for us to, you know, we're only four years old. We can, some, if we, even if we planted day one, we, you know, possibly could barely get grapes. And then we have to age the wine a year or two on top of that. So uh, this was, this was fortuitous. Uh, definitely. Uh, so in the first year, uh, he maintained it all year, um, somewhat, somewhat poorly. <clears throat> Sorry, Jeff, if you watch this. Um, but uh, so the next year we helped him. Uh, he maintained it, but we helped him harvest. And then this last year, 2019-20, um, I actually, we actually hired a, a full-time girl uh, down there. Uh, she lives in Morden, Manitoba, which is about half hour outside the vineyard, um, to maintain. So she's there uh, four or five days a week, uh, trimming and doing whatever pe people do. And uh, it was all our people for the last two harvests, uh, harvesting all the grapes. So that's a great, um, great part of our business. Uh, we've actually started planting more uh, different varietals now, just to experiment and to see what will happen. Uh, if it's not obvious, I'm not I'm not a horticulturist by any means. I barely, I one time I killed a cactus in my house. Um, I'm not very good with plants, but my partner is more um, on that side of the business. Um, I'm, I do mostly sales and marketing is, is my side of the business. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're planting, uh, it started about 0.8 of an acre. Now we're up to like two acres. Uh, we're planting uh, more and more. I have another two acres worth of vines coming in uh, this spring to plant. Uh, and we have about 10 different varietals down there. Um, the ones that work the best, uh, the rosé is a Frontenac and the white is a Vandel Cliché. And those are uh, grapes that have been developed by uh, different universities um, to basically be uh, hybrids of cold hardy grapes that taste poor and good tasting grapes uh, that don't survive winters. Uh, these are cold climate grapes. Uh, even like BC, Ontario are cool climate grapes. Uh, cold climate grapes don't really exist commercially. So this is, uh, to my knowledge, one of the only operations uh, of commercial winemaking that are working with these kind of, uh, kind of uh, vines in this kind of uh, conditions. So that is fun. And then uh, I guess last big step that we did uh, was in 2000 and uh, right at the end of 2019, but pretty much January 2020, um, we renovated the front of our space. Uh, that's where I'm sitting right now uh, to be a little wine bar, uh, tasting room, wine bar, uh, whatever. So you can get a sit down, get a glass of wine. Uh, we do wine tasting flights. We have cocktails, charcuterie board, different things like that. 
Uh, obviously, we are closed by public health order at the moment. Um, we, we hit our year anniversary of being open the bar uh, about uh, a couple weeks ago. And uh, we, we were open three and a half months out of the 12. Um, so thanks, uh, COVID. But, uh, you know, better safe than sorry, right? But uh, yeah, we did all the renos ourselves. I'll give you a tour here in a, in a, in a little second, but it's a pretty intimate uh, small space. It's only about 10 capacity. Um, the tables are messed up right now because of COVID, but uh, usually we have like, there's like a lounge area, which I'm sitting in right now with a couch and a, and a table. And then there's a, another room with more tables and the, the bar seating or whatever. So, um, so that's located at 448B Brooklyn Street uh, in Winnipeg, Manitoba in sunny St. James, uh, just off Route 90, right by Polo Park. Um, and so uh, feel free to put that in your Zerp. We're going to do that as soon as COVID's over. Let's go drink some, 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 some wine. Um, or just Google Shrugging Doctor, right? You know, it'll come up. Um, ba, 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 ba. So yeah, this it's been a it's been a weird year. It's been uh, the bar's been closed. Uh, that's that's great. Uh, we can't do any sampling. We haven't done sampling since February of last month, which or last year, sorry. Which um, uh, I'm sure you can imagine that pushes a majority of our sales is being able to uh, give free samples uh, to people, but we haven't been able to do that. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, been a weird year, but we are surviving, evidently. I think people are probably drinking more uh, while they're staying home, uh, which is good. But uh, as of now, uh, we are up to six people on our team. Uh, we're all under the age of 26 years old, and uh, not one of us has a university degree. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I think that's pretty much pretty much the story. Should I go go to the tour, guys? Should someone someone give me a thumbs up? We'll just do it anyway, right? Yes, yes, Vilas, yes, please. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to hold you like this, so bear with me. Um, so we will start uh, at where any good story starts, um, at the front door. This is the front door. Um, so you, this is uh, this is kind of what the bar looks like. Um, it's uh, like I said, we did all the renos um, ourselves. So this is actually a uh, the counter that we used. Uh, we ripped out of um, my friend's like father's kitchen. He was like doing renos. We're like, can we have your counter? He's like, what? Um, basically, everything in here is a thrift store uh, or stolen. Um, just kidding. Ha, ha I would never commit a crime or admit to committing a crime anyway. Um, but, uh, yeah. So we have, uh, you know, little, a little seating there. And then, uh, we go into the lounge, you know, the couch, uh, tables. Usually there's more tables here. We're using this as uh, overflow storage now because of, um, you know, COVID. So whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, we even have a little, little projector so you can we put a movie on the movie on the thing have a movie night that's fun um and then there's usually uh, more seating here obviously um in a non non-covid year um products um so these are core products uh up here i hope the buzz of the fridge isn't too loud but uh so our apple cider our raspberry wine uh, these are our two meads uh, here and here. So those are made from honey. We have a regular mead and then an apple cinnamon mead. Uh, we have two sangrias, so that's wine and fruit juice. We have a regular uh, red sangria and then a uh, white sangria. We call it the tropical sangria. Um, and then our uh, cranberry wine. Uh, seasonals right now are our uh, Concord wine that's made from Manitoba grapes. Uh, our raspberry chocolate. So that's our raspberry wine aged in real cocoa. So you get like a nice kind of subtle chocolate mix. You like my hand movements here, guys? I like it too. Um, and then our 2019 white wine is a uh, Gewurztraminer. Uh, so that's a uh, varietal that we hadn't used before. So that's, uh, this is the 2019 uh, white wine. So this is uh, on sale still for a little bit here. Um, all the seasonals are aged um, about a year, um, sometimes more, uh, never less. Uh, but sometimes more depending on, uh, just depending on when, basically when the last seasonal sells out, uh, then we release the next one. 
so up next is blueberry wine. Uh, we, oh, we also have a wine club if anyone's interested. Go to shrugdoc.com, S-H-R-U-G-D-O-C.com slash club, uh, and you can join the wine club. So uh, the reason I mentioned that is because the blueberry wine has actually been available for two months uh, for members of the wine club. Um, but it's uh, being released to the, to the general public uh, for February at some point. Because um, we just sold out of um, uh, our last seasonal. So that'll be the next one that comes up. Uh, in the bar, we do uh, we have these little uh, tasting boards. I'll show you in a second. So we have, um, you basically get five servings of, uh, of whatever you like. Um, so you, those are uh, three ounce, three ounce servings. Uh, so you can try five different products. You can mix and match from the menu. Um, that's our most popular um, menu item by far. Uh, we also do a little. Um, we don't have a kitchen in this building. Obviously, it's pretty small, but uh, we have a uh, charcuterie that we make uh, out of all Manitoba products. Uh, so it's like smack dab mustard, uh, meat from uh, Deluca's. Um, uh, Bothwell cheese, um, uh, what else? Elman's pickles, which is a Manitoba company. Fun fact. And um, yeah, so we try to we try to keep it uh, Manitoban as possible. Um, it's, yeah, it's not very exciting, but uh, I like it. Uh, it shows my childhood fantasies of just like working out of a bar all day. So um, so that's good. Um, and then I guess I will take you into the back. Let's um, let's. Go. Ah, it's right back here. Um, so I'll just kind of do like a pan over, um, just so you can see, and then I will go more into depth of uh, of every individual part, so you can see. So, I mean, not very, not very exciting as far as things go, but you know, it is what it is. Um, when we opened, um, we started with three uh, 500 liter tanks. So that's, um, the, these are two of them up here. Uh, and then the other one's over there. Uh, so we started with three of those. And now uh, we're up to about, what, 10,000? Probably more. I think about 12,000 liters a month is now what we're producing. Um, so... Uh, yeah, and it was just like a lot of upgrading on uh, on profit, right? It was just like save up a little bit of money to buy more, to sell more, to buy more. Um, all these different pallets are uh, are different products uh, that we have uh, aging. Uh, usually, the stuff on the top shelves are aging for longer um, because they're out of my way, obviously. Um, but yeah, this this entire space back here is actually only 800 square feet, so we are making making do. I will, I yeah yeah so. Um, so we make uh, we ferment everything here. Um, I don't have my my press and my uh, crusher are in storage right now, uh, offsite um, storage because it is winter and we don't use them in the winter. But uh, we basically have a device that looks like um, I don't know. It's a bunch of gears. It's like a gears with a hopper on top, and uh, it's a crusher destemmer. So you basically drop fruit into it, and it like shoots the stems out one side and, and shoots the fruit out the other, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we have a press, which basically just looks like a cylinder. Um, just Google wine press, guys. You'll find it. Um, but it's uh, basically a cylinder, fills with water. It's called a bladder press, and then it presses the fruit. Juice comes out. Uh, great. So we do that. Um, and then we put the juice in that. And then you wait for nine months and or 12 months and or one million months. Um, I don't know. People always expect, uh, <laughs> I think, winemaking to be more glamorous, but it's a lot of waiting around. Um, but uh, yeah, pretty much all these tanks are full right now, which is uh, which is great. Uh, this is actually stacked here uh, at the door because this is going out to liquor and lotteries um, uh, on Monday. Uh, so it's an 80 case order of uh, of raspberry, which is going out. Um, and then, yeah, we bottle everything uh, by hand. I guess I can walk you through the bottling process as well. Uh, so once the um, once the fruit is pressed and fermented, um, once it's finished fermenting, um, 
because basically for fermentation is you add yeast to uh, something with sugar. The yeast eats the sugar and creates two things. Uh, carbon dioxide, which gets filtered out uh, through the top uh, little filter thing, and then uh, ethanol, ethyl alcohol. And uh, that's the that's the that's the good stuff. So uh, after it's finished fermenting, which means the yeast is eaten, there's no more sugar to eat, or the yeast has di died, or whenever we tell it to stop, depends on the product. Uh, you do what's called racking, which is you move uh, the wine from uh, one tank, uh, one vat uh, to another. Uh, I say tank all the time, but one time I said that to a French uh, winery owner, and she. Um, didn't speak very good English, and she thought I meant like a tank, like a military tank. Um, so now I correct myself. But yeah, so you move it from one vat uh, to the other, uh, and the idea with that is all the yeast and and gook and uh, you know leftover skins and all the garbage is left at the bottom, like pointing the tank. And actually, the bigger tanks we have, if you notice, oh god, my knees, um, they're uh, they're concave on the bottom. You can't really see, but uh, there are cones on the bottom. So all that yeast and stuff gets trapped in the in the bottom of the cone, so it's easy to uh, eat clean. And then the good wine gets moved over into a thing. And then you wait for, we usually do about half and half in stainless steel and then in bottles. Uh, it doesn't actually make a huge difference. I think it's probably better for it in, in the tanks, in the vats. Wow, I did it again. In the vats to, uh, to age, but... Um, really just based on if we need the space or not um and then once it uh yes and then once it's ready to bottle then we bottle it so this is this process here we take the empty bottles which we buy from a bottle company and we put them in the bottle rinser so that is this device here uh, these get put in the sink and hooked up to the sink uh so you know uh 12 holes on each of them, 12 bottles in a box. You put them in there and then you flick the flick the thing, zerp, and it sprays them with water from the tap. Um, so if there's any so if there's any weird dust, then it gets gets all all cleaned out and that's good. And then they get lifted from there onto this device here, which is our bottle filler. Uh, actually, up in, this isn't even a year old. Up until like a year ago, we were using a two-head bottle filler, which was so slow. Um, Zach and I used to just like bottle all night, like because we would have to work during the day. Like I would have to be doing sales and farmers markets and stuff, and he would, you know, be doing whatever. And then we'd have to bottle at night, so we would start at like you know midnight and then bottle till 8 a.m. And then I would go back to back to work. Uh, longest we ever did was a 24 hour straight uh, bottling session because if we didn't get the order out that the next day, um, we would just go out of business and the wine was only ready the day before. So now we're a little bit nicer to ourselves, but uh, we still do everything by hand. So now this is a uh, six head um, gravity filler. So basically the pump, we just use a pump to get it up into this uh, reservoir that holds about 30 liters, um, maybe 80 liters, 30 cases, I don't care. Um, and then it just gets gravity uh, filled into the bottles. Um, and then they get taken off the bottle thing and put onto this device, which is awesome as well. This is a cork, corker, cork, corking, corking machine. Um, so it's, uh, it's pneumatic. It's hooked up to a uh, air compressor. So you put the cork in the top, put the bottle in, zerp, um, bottles does it. And then this is our high, very high tech label machine. Uh, you put the bottle on here and you turn the thing and the label comes out. Um, we bought that for a hundred dollars from a guy in a garage uh, in California. Um, man, I don't know. Um, and then they get thrown in this thing, which is called a heat tunnel, um, which uh, melts um, we put like plastic seals on the top so they don't get, you know, tampered with or anything. So it melts the seal to the top of the box. That's the annoying thing you have to cut with the cut with the top of your corkscrew. And then uh, get put in a box and the box gets labels thrown on it. And then we zerp, sell them. Um, and then, yeah, well, and then uh, I guess lastly, um, 
I will talk about our newest uh, product line, which are uh, we're calling white shells. Uh, they're vodka sodas. Um, I'm not going to use any competitor names, but I, you probably have it in your head who this is imitating. Uh, or they're actually imitating us. But um, it's 5% uh, alcohol. They're no sugar, no carbs. Uh, they're just uh, carbonated Manitoba water, natural flavors, and, and alcohol. Um, so we have a raspberry flavor and a uh, lime flavor right now. Uh, they're great for, um, we actually came up with the name because Zach has a cabin in the white shell and we were sitting on the dock uh, at his cabin and saying, oh, I don't want to drink any more 12% wine. I wish we had something, something bubble, bubble, bubble man to drink. That would be good. And uh, here, here we are. So white shell. So these are available now at Liquor Marts. They're also available in, uh, in a lot of uh, beer vendors. Um, you can find a full list on uh, Liquor Marts' website. Uh, just start shrugging, doctor, you'll find them. So that's our newest project. Uh, with that, uh, we also, so we only have two flavors of that available right now, um, but we have more in development. Uh, the plan was to test stuff in kegs uh, at the bar, but bar has been closed, who knows? So um, um, yeah, I don't know, guys. I think I'll probably um, ask for some direction here. Uh, if we wanna do questions, we can do that. Or if there's something that I missed that I should talk about. Uh, let me know. Oh, I was going to quickly show. I have pictures of the vineyard on the wall um, that I can show you. Yeah. I don't know if that's in focus. Oh, I can make it bigger. Hold on. Okay. So that's our uh, the trellises or whatever, the rows of vines. Um, yeah. So the vineyard is in a undisclosed location in southern Manitoba, uh, in the Pemina Valley between uh, Morden and the U.S. border, uh, somewhere in that area. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Anyone? Uh, what are we doing? Yeah. Uh, we, know we have some questions. So we can, if you are ready, we can move on to the question and answer session. Absolutely. Okay. So... Uh, I would like to ask John to ask his question. I think he mentioned he has a few questions, a couple of questions. So it is from John Trotsky. Hey, yeah, that's me. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Willows, for a great presentation. Um, oh, yeah, no have a couple of questions for you. You know, I think I've been to your vineyard. Okay. Uh, it's a great thing that you guys are making uh, – wine out of Manitoba grapes. That's absolutely fantastic. I'm yeah. definitely going to buy some. A um, couple of questions I have that are not technical and then uh, just a couple of technical ones afterwards. Um, how much is your, your wine per bottle? Uh, so it ranges. Uh, the, the grape wines are about $22 to $25. Um, okay. the, the ciders are more in the $10 range. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, average probably around fifteen, sixteen dollars, uh, depending on the product. Uh, they range okay. from nine nine ninety nine at the lowest to uh, twenty seven at the highest. Okay, and it's um, uh, the wine is the wine, the grape wine. Is it available now in the store? Uh, so the grape wine is not available at liquor marts uh, because we don't have enough. Yeah. Okay. Um, they um, we would just sell it too quickly uh, to them. So we keep it uh, kind of around for ourselves. Uh, so our retail store in St. James, again, that's 448B Brooklyn Street uh, in sunny St. James is open uh, Saturday and Sunday, 5 p.m. to 9 p.m. right now for walk-in purchases. Um, we are usually open uh, larger um, times, but COVID has just kind of, you know, whatever. Yeah. But yeah. Our retail store, everything we produce is always available here uh, first, and any of the exclusives are always available at our store. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, I think you know, the wine, oh yeah, the wine from the Manitoba grapes, you said you had white wine and rosé? Yeah. Do you have any red? Uh, we don't have any red as of now. Uh, evidently, it does not get hot enough to grow red grapes. Okay, okay. The the only thing we have is like a Concord wine, which is, you know, deeper red in color, but I, I wouldn't classify it as a, it's too sweet to be classified as a, as a red wine. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're working on some things. Um, 
you know, who knows, in 10 years with global warming, maybe it'll be a great uh, opportunity to grow more grapes here. Um, But we're even looking into maybe, this is kind of just wishful thinking, but maybe if we could like buy some land in like Ontario or something and have grow grapes over there and then like bring them back over here, like something like that would be, would be awesome because, um, you know, as much innovation as we can possibly do, we are constrained to, uh, it's still minus 50 and, uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, but it's great. It's great that you're making wine from grapes in Manitoba. Now, a couple of, just a couple of quick technical questions. Yeah. Do you maintain the same temperature of fermentation throughout the year? Uh, we try to. Um, we have temperature. Th- uh, I think it's typically, uh, we got to keep these tanks around 18 degrees Celsius. Um, so depending on how warm the building is, we either are cooling it down or, or, or raising it up. Um, the, uh, it only really matters for the first three or four days of fermentation. Uh, fermenta- uh, any fermentation is, a, uh, is an exothermic reaction, so it's releasing heat. Uh, and if any of these uh, tanks get too hot, the yeast can can die. Um, so we'll um, sometimes it'll be pretty cold in here, uh, depending on how many things we have uh, fermenting at once. We might turn the heat down uh, quite a bit. But uh, yeah, around 18 to 22, I think, is the kind of perfect perfect range. Okay, good. And now my last question, I don't want to hog everybody, but um, do you run into any quality issues? Um, I mean, like as much as I think any probably small business does, um, I, I, we have very little, uh, complaints, uh, if any, um, most people that purchase the products come back for more. Um, I would probably say the products that we were selling four years ago, aren't, you know, quite the quality that they are now. And that was just, uh, you know, budgetary restrictions. We didn't have the equipment. Uh, we were like renting a fruit press from the brew supply store and like we just you know we didn't have enough money for an air conditioner the first summer so st- some things got too hot like you know it is what it yeah. is but yeah. um as of now um no not really i, I stand behind pr- the quality of, of pretty much everything we produce out of this building very good thank you very much yeah thank you for your questions uh, the other question is from melissa i i would like to uh, invite melissa to ask Hi. Great presentation, Willows. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, My question is, uh, you you know, you've got some great flavors of wine there, and it was very interesting to hear that you could ferment cocoa beans. I didn't know you could, (laughs) but is is there a particular wine that you've made that has been the most challenging? Good question. Challenging. I mean, like, uh, you know, depends what you define challenging. Like the the grape wines we definitely have to put the most work into like it takes you know two and a half full-time employees to make and 30 people to go harvest them to make sure uh uh, everything goes well um we're just we like experimenting we like uh, trying new things um but uh yeah i don't know it's not necessarily difficult but i the grapes are definitely uh you know, it's, it's a, it's a next step from, uh, from everything else. Cause all the other fruit, um, most of like we, we have cherries on the property as well, but all the other fruit we don't personally tend to and grow. We just buy f- from local farmers and stuff. Um, so the stuff that we have to do ourselves is, um, is obviously harder. I'm not exactly a fan of going out to the vineyard and, and, and picking grapes on my knees for 10 hours, but you know, you, you do what you got to do when you're a business owner, right? That's great. Thanks. Yep. Thanks for your question. Appreciate it. I, there's a question from Mahit. Yeah, uh, so I had uh, two questions. Uh, uh, the first one is, um, do you design the uh, bottle labels and the website yourself as the uh, sales, or do you get someone else to do that? So we work with a, uh, with a company. Um, sorry, my heater kicked on. I'm going to move. 
where it's quieter. Uh, we work with a, a great company called Groundwork Creative Company. Uh, they uh, they do all the actual graphic design. Um, I come up with kind of the concepts, and then I, I send my graphic designer basically a poorly made uh, Microsoft Paint of what I want, and then he comes up with with a good. Uh, it was actually a funny story how we met him. Um, he worked for a uh, I won't say the name, but he worked for a large um, marketing firm here in Winnipeg, and um, my friend who was helping us uh, start the business at the time um, just met him on a bus randomly, and they were just you know chatting or whatever. And as of at this point, I was using just like a Google image of a doctor that I found on my labels, and I'm like, okay, we're opening in three weeks. Um, I can't just use this stolen Google picture. And like that week, I don't know if it's synchronicity or something, but that week, um, my friend meets this guy on a bus and he goes, oh, I'm a graphic designer. I actually just quit my job to start my own graphic design company and I don't have any clients. And my friend goes, oh, actually, I have a client for you. So I sent him all, all everything I had, the concept, the whatever. And he showed up with a booklet like this thick and a mem memory stick with logos and colors and fonts and all this made. And he puts it on my desk and he says, use this or don't pay, pay me or don't pay me, but it's yours. And uh, ever since then, uh, he's he's been on the payroll. He does every single design um, that we do. So shout out Neil at uh, Groundwork Creative Co. If you need some uh, graphic design, definitely hit him up. Oh yeah, that's great. Uh the other question I also had was, um, how many uh, full-time employees do you have altogether? Uh, we're up to six people on the team, so four employees plus Zach and myself. Um, hours are kind of shot completely now because of COVID, obviously. I've had people laid off for a couple of months, come back for a month, whatever. Um, but we're up to, up to four employees, two partners uh, on our team right now. Thanks. Yeah, cheers. Thanks for the question. Uh, next in line, Dr. Aluko. Please, Dr. Aluko. Uh, thank you very much, Willows. Uh, my question is, uh, how do you determine the quality of your grapes or, you know, the fruits you use? Uh, since you, you buy some of them, right? How do you know they are the right quality, actually, from year to year? Yeah, I'll... I don't know if I can find it, but there's a tool called a refractometer. Um, my shelves are a mess, hold on. There is a tool, yeah, called a refractometer, which basically uh, measures the sugar contents or something. He says, yeah, here we go. <laughs> So you basically put uh, a little bit of fruit juice uh, in there and then um, you like look through it and you can tell how much sugar contents they're going to be uh, in the thing. Uh, so we can be, and that's basically um, the quality of the fruit is um, number one, does it taste good? I'll, you know, I'll take pick a strawberry and be like, mm, this tastes like a strawberry. And then number two, what's the sugar content? Um, so sugar, uh, the sugar content will determine how much the yeast has to eat, which will determine the end uh, alcohol percentage. Uh, so some years it varies. So you'll notice our seasonals will vary a percent or two, uh, depending on the year. Um, but every product that we produce every year, we just get, uh, we send off to a lab to get lab tested. So then we have all the exact information and the alcohol percentage uh, as well. So uh, I guess the answer is science. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks for the question. There's a question from Renisa. Renisa, yeah. Hi, Willows. Thank you again for the presentation. Um, question. So would you be making ice wine or ice cider at all? Uh, we don't produce any uh, at the moment. Uh, we definitely talked about it. Um, if people aren't familiar, ice wine 
is basically um, you wait until the grapes freeze on first frost, and then you like run out with 500 people and you pick them within two hours and, and make sure they all get used immediately. Uh, and this creates a really concentrated, high percentage sweet uh, wine. Um, we can't do it with the grapes because as of now, you know, we sell out of a year's worth of the grape wine in three months. So we don't just have enough uh, grapes. And uh, we were going to do it with uh, with apples. We were working with a picker in uh, in or a grower in Morden uh, that was growing uh, Kerr apples, K-E-R-R apples, which are like uh, they're bigger, they're more sweet. I don't know, whatever. They're good apples. So we were going to do it with those. Uh, and then. Uh, I mean, I, I love the guy, but uh, Dead Horse Cider, uh, they opened up in Morden uh, and uh, they stole all our apples. So uh, not enough, not enough apples in Manitoba to do it evidently, but it is uh, something um, that is uh, in the future, I would say, uh, as we can grow more grapes and stuff. Perfect. Looking forward to that. <laughs> Hi, Vilos. It's uh, Vijay again. Um, no, I have been to farmer's market and I, I got, I think this year I got one of your fruit wine. We liked it. Oh, but, thank you. Uh, so, and thank you for the presentation. And uh, so my question is, do you have like, a, for fruit wines, like seasonal fruit wines, do you have like designated suppliers from local farms? Do you have some like designated suppliers to cons consistently supply you or do you have, how do you source them? Yeah, good question. Um, we, it's kind of changed over the years. Um, I remember the first strawberry rhubarb wine we ever produced in 2018, uh, we actually got all the rhubarb from just people on my Facebook's like backyards. I just made a Facebook status and said, hey, anyone got any rhubarb? And we like drove around the city just picking people's rhubarb. Um, we're a little bit more uh, sophisticated now. Uh, for the strawberries and the rhubarb, we work with one uh, individual person. We buy his entire harvest every year. Um, he's just not a business. He's just a guy with a farm or whatever. And we just, you know, buy all his stuff. Um, the Saskatoons, we have two main suppliers that we, uh, that we use for those. Um, but uh, Different than, like for instance, like the Concord wine that we made last year, um, guy just called our business line and said, "Hey, I got a Concord farm. Do you want, you know, two thousand pounds of Concords?" They said, "Yeah." So sometimes it's just people fall out of the sky and give us fruits. Uh, sometimes uh, we seek out, uh, you know, people. Um, but uh, we're always looking for. Uh, I know there's a lot of food scientists in here. We're always looking for more fruits. So if you have. Uh, fruit for us. Give me the fruits. Uh, minimum I can work with is like 2,000 pounds, like basically about a ton. Uh, it would be the minimum. But uh, if you got that laying around with something, let me know. I'll make it into a cool wine that you can taste in two years. I have another follow up question. Sure. Have you, because you no, know, I was, when I was a student, and I, I think in our class, we made a Carrot wine. Do you have any idea of using any other other than fruits in your wine making? Yeah, I mean, like uh, the, one of the biggest problems um, since our inception has been keeping up with demand, uh, which people always say it's a good problem to have, but it is a problem. Um, so a lot of our products we can you know barely keep up with production to to keep up. Um, but yeah. It, Technically, anything with any sugar content in it could theoretically be made into a wine. So um, we, uh, we're trying to focus a lot on prairie fruits, obviously, and stuff that we can grow around here. But, uh, you know, perhaps um, we'll move into uh, do some seasonals of, of small batch carrots and, and who knows what, uh, whatever else grows here. But, uh, yeah, maybe on the horizon. Thank you. Dakmara has a question. Hi, Willows. Hello. Thank you so much for, for the tour and the, all the information that you're sharing with us. It's so exciting. Um, so I'm wondering about your research and development. You guys are so innovative. You're trying different things. Uh, is it done just in the kitchen? Uh, how, like, how do you go about your R&D? Yeah, that's, uh, I think, probably the fav my favorite part of the job. 
is um, we have to drink 40 different slight variations of a product to figure out what tastes good. So um, <laughs> yeah, we, we just do everything in the building here, basically um, whether it's uh, some fruit that's happened on us from happenstance or we've seeped it out or whatever to make a new product, we'll take the fruits. Uh, we have these little, I'll show you. We have these little uh, fermenters. This is a hundred liters. Mm -hmm. um, so we usually use those for uh, just test batches of stuff. So we make a hundred liters of, you know, name a thing, carrot wine, and then we uh, we taste it. If it tastes good, then we'll basically put it down, um, you know, pour it in a cup, add some sugar and malic acid, and then the next cup we'll add 75% of that sugar, but 110% of that malic acid, and then do that a bunch of times. And I just have to keep drinking wine. Um, <laughs> all day to see which one tastes the best. And then we usually sleep it off and then wake up in the morning and then taste it again to see if it was actually good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, we just kind of um, make what we think is gonna taste good and then and then just experiment and add different things and uh, different, uh, different secret ingredients and, and uh, see what works. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. Thanks for having us. If you guys want to follow us, uh, Shrug Doc, S H R U or S H R U G D O C on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, my name is Willows. You can find me at Vote Willows, V O T E W I L L O W S on everything Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, anything, whatever you can think of. Um, 448B Brooklyn Street in St. James. We're also available on Skip the Dishes, Uber Eats, uh, Bottle Drive, uh, Liquor Marts, uh, Beer Vendors, and Shrugdot.com, S-H-R-U-G-D-O-C.com. Please bookmark that and buy some wine because I need to pay rent pretty soon. <laughs> and thanks again to you guys for hosting and giving us this opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.